Welcome to another episode of Outer Heaven, the Knives Monroe podcast. I'm your host, Knives Monroe, and this episode is brought to you in part by Flashback by Outer Heaven. Record, relive, remember. Did you know people forget 40% of what they learned in 20 minutes and 77% of what they learned in six days? They forget 90% in one month. And actually, surprisingly, millennials are more forgetful than baby boomers. Our experience of the world is perceived 83% with our sense of sight. Video is processed by the brain 60,000 times faster than text. One minute of video, in fact, is equal to 1.8 million words. That's pretty quick. 90% of information transmitted to the brain is visual. Video triggers emotions like no other medium. Video is forever. That's the power of video, okay? Outer Heaven's flashback services commit to preserving your moment with photo and video. Let us protect your memories and share them with your loved one. Relive the experience with those who couldn't be there. Flashback. Record. Relive. Remember. Oh, Hey, guys. This episode, uh, man, I, I want them all to be this good. I'm not going to, I'm not just saying that, you know, thank you very much for listening. This, epi- this episode is actually going to be uh, uh, a doozy. You know, we went out there, we, it got pretty deep uh, real quick as well. I kind of feel bad because uh, with our guests, I didn't really get to get into his work. Uh, this guy is prolific and, uh, you know, I, I I, I want to speak to as many musicians as possible because truth be told, somewhere deep down inside, I mean, I wish I could have been a musician. You know, this guy, Luis Cantu, our guest today, uh, is incredible. Um, now, I'm going to have a, his social in the show notes. Check him out. Follow him on social. Um, check his stuff out on YouTube. He's really going to blow your mind, and I, I really see a big future for this guy. Hopefully, um, as soon as he gets out of the valley, I think that's when his wings are going to be able to spread and he's going to be able to spread love like violence. Um, Now, but before we get into the guest, uh, I did want to dedicate uh, this particular episode to Yvette Franco, who was a Valley native. She um, was from Donna and, um, you know, she went missing about a week ago as of this recording and was found uh, just a few days ago, her body. And uh, I want to dedicate this episode to her memory. I want to dedicate this episode to her friends, especially her family and everybody that, you know, she ever got into contact with. Um, you know, life is precious and tomorrow's not guaranteed. All we really have is the moment. And, uh, you know, I think Yvette knew that. I was fortunate enough to call her an acquaintance. You know, she came over to my mom's house a few years ago. She used to work with my brother at the movie theater in Westlaco. And, uh, you know, we would party. She was cool. She was funny. You know, she got into working out real hard and she became a very disciplined, independent woman. And, uh, you know, she passed away way too young. And, um, you know, this kind of stuff happens. Um, in, in my hometown, you know, anywhere in, in probably your hometown. And it's just a reminder that, you know, you have to, um, you know, love your friends, your family, your, your, your mother, your daughter, your sister. Um, you got to love these women and cherish them while they're here because um, from one second to the next, um, they might not be here tomorrow. Th- that's a fact, you know, and... Um, my heart really does go out to to her parents. Um, I have a little girl, and if something tragic were to happen to her, um, you know, that would be it for me. And uh, these parents have a lot of strength, and uh, they're showing this entire town um, just how strong they are and how much they love their daughter. So as of right now, I don't believe funeral services um, are out there in the public. Um so if you're listening to this and, and you knew Yvette Franco, you know, um, just know that this episode is dedicated to her. It's the least I can really do. Uh, we, we get into all kinds of topics and it gets very strange. And um, I think there's something very sweet there and very, um, you know, special 
end the episode um, that I think is worth sharing and, and is worth uh, preserving and was definitely worth recording. So Yvette, um, <laughs> you know, I'm not a spiritual person. I don't know if I would ever say that I have a soul um, or that souls exist, but, you know, if you're out there, um, you know, I, I was very grateful to, to have met you. And, uh, you know, I hope this, this episode makes you proud in some way, shape, or form. Uh, it'll always be there in your memory. Now, uh, guys, I just want to say thank you very much for listening to the Outer Heaven podcast. And if you've made it this far, um, you know, I really appreciate that. Um, sorry, you know, if I don't get into, um, you know, a discussion like I want to in this particular episode, in this intro, um, I really didn't want to make it about anything else, um, other than Yvette. Um, but I just want to end it saying, you know, uh, I still haven't received any, any emails from anybody. So if you're, if you're listening to this right now, why haven't you emailed and asked me anything? at the outer heaven h a e v e n at gmail.com i mean that kind of hurts you know what i mean um we're on soundcloud maybe you're listening to this on itunes rate us on itunes that would make me feel warm and fuzzy that would make me feel like i'm not a fuck up <laughs> now i don't need you guys to make me feel that way i'm doing pretty good for myself um you guys are hearing this you're hearing this on monday Thursday's podcast, um, I definitely have a lot of stuff that I want to get get off my chest, so please check that out. Subscribe, share this, um, especially down here in the Rio Grande Valley. A lot of people haven't really heard of podcasts, I don't think. Anytime I, I talk about them, people kind of just give me strange looks like, what is that, like a radio show of some sort? And uh, they don't even, there's no rednecks in the valley, I don't even know why they did that, but... Um, they're more like, como que pinche podcast y la verga, more like that. Um, and uh, so share this and get the word out there. You know what I mean? Podcasts have been around for like 10 years. Get in that. Get all up in that. Share. Subscribe. You can find me on Instagram at the Outer Heaven H-A-E-V-E-N, or Knives Monroe. You can find me on, follow me on Twitter at Knives Monroe, or of course, uh, Facebook, but... If you're a stranger, I'm not really going to talk to you, you know? I got to stop adding random people um, on Facebook. It's it's, it's weird, you know? Uh, you guys look at my pictures and stuff and see my intimate stuff, you know? It's weird. It makes me feel weird, but it's great business. Without further ado, guys, this is officially episode two with my guest, Looper and musician extraordinaire. You can see him live on Mondays at Mac Nights at Yerberia Cultura. Ladies and gentlemen, the future, Luis Cantu. You know, um, I want to, I don't want to be like uh, that hipster that I don't eat meat anymore. But I don't need meat. Like, I don't crave meat. Like, I have a, a friend who craves, like, steak. Yeah. I don't eat steak. When I go to an Outback Steakhouse or something, I get chicken or fish, which is, like, um, something you're not supposed to do. But Do you, uh, do you have an, uh, another way of intaking iron and... Beans? Yeah. Lentils? Soybeans? Um, yeah. Yeah, well, that... Might... I have never been to the doctor, actually. So, I don't... For all I know, I have no iron. Ne you neither? No. Um, we just fist bumped. <laughs> yeah, I just. Uh, I don't it's a terrible trust, thing to be proud of. <laughs> I don't trust the pharmaceutical companies. I but that's like, not all they do. There's a uh, uh, dietitians. There's that's true, that's true. Um, local dietitians. I trust. Sure, yeah, sure, but sure. It seems that in stitch when 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 they work. You don't go to a butcher and then you ask for a <laughs> diet plan. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It seems like institutions are more worried about uh, profiteering off of us. Like, how can we make this a long-term customer of instead of how can how can we cure them? You know? Last time I came here, to, um, I call this the Outer Heaven Studios. Um, there was a doctor that was here, and he told he was showing me all his credentials and everything. He's like, I moved to the valley because obesity, diabetes is crazy here, and like the doctors, they don't even treat diabetes. Diabetes, they don't try to prevent it. They're just like, let's put you on dialysis. 
Yeah. Like, and I'm just like, damn. Straight and, to it. And he says, like, on his way to church every Sunday, he sees, like, the dialysis clinic and it's just packed like a Walmart. And I was like, oh, that hurt to hear. Mm. And I feel responsible for that because, you know, um, not responsible, but I feel I have to, like, I have to confront my Hispanic genes and the, like, the culture. Yeah. It's like we all enable that. So I'm responsible for that. Yeah, and our, our culture, you're right. Like, we have a lot of greasy foods. It's very uh, bad. Yeah. It's good, but it's bad. It's you know? good for the tongue, bad for the body. Yeah, and it's finally taken its toll on me. I remember uh, in 2005, I dropped 70 pounds. I went from 240 to 170 in the mm-hmm. summer, accidentally. Like, I, I stopped eating because I was dating a bulimic at the time, and I just couldn't eat with her, right, especially. And I couldn't eat at all. So I basically didn't eat for a summer. But... Um, I can't do that today. I can't do that 10 years later. Like yeah. try to lose weight, like especially rapidly. I can't. I, so it has to be gradual. It has gradual. to be like, I stopped the sugar water. I stopped this. I stopped that. And I don't have to worry about that anymore. Hmm. And you when know? you do it like uh, gradually, it's more permanent. It's supposed to be a lifestyle. Yeah, it is. A lifestyle change. Yeah. I have some friends that work out and they're like, oh, I can't wait till I don't have to work out anymore. And I look at them like, yeah. yeah. It's a lifestyle change. Like, if you want right. to look like that, you have to do everything you're doing right now for yeah. as long as you can. And yeah. you kind of got sad. But, I mean, someone has to tell these people, like, it's not for aesthetics. Yeah. It's for your health. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm torn. Like, I do care about my health. Like I said, I haven't been to the doctor, and I want to get blood done. And I want them to tell me, dude, you're, no, it's bad. You need to do this. I'll be like, oh, give me leverage to care. But it's it's kind of superficial. Like, I just want to look good naked. Yeah. You know? I don't like I mean, being, that's just the honest, the honest truth. Yeah, yeah. I don't like being fat. And like uh, making love, like being fat, because then I feel like it's not as good as it can, it's, it's supposed to be. <laughs> you want to get the best for your woman. Yeah. yeah. And also, I want to accept her love. I, I can't accept that she's making love to like Humpty Dumpty. I can't accept that. It's not as fulfilling. <laughs> it's not as fulfilling as it can be. Yeah. Um, so I'm working on that. It's superficial. I do want uh, to go to a doctor. That's my goal <laughs> this year. To get blood work done, to get the whole... I've never had a, a physical. Even in high school or middle school, nobody ever touched my balls and was like, cough. I, I, I don't even think people do that. They do, right? Like, yeah. that's a thing. It's never happened to me. So, I don't know. I'm missing out. Yeah. I don't know. They, they can catch early stuff like, you know, cancerous signs, symptoms, yeah. things like that. I know. Nature. Yeah. But I feel you on the whole... Uh, yeah, there is some aesthetics to it, and we can't, we can't shun away from that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel like the reason that it, that the, those body types look attractive to us is because we know that behind that is good decisions. That's what it is. That's what it is. It's like, oh, this guy knows how to make right choices and women are attracted to that. He has discipline or whatever. He has discipline, yeah. yeah I, know. I, 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 I hate that when people look at me, uh, they see my, my past five years decisions and, yeah. and I feel like I'm that's obsolete I'm trying to change that yeah I've lost like 45 pounds something like that oh congrats just by doing similar things like leaving sugar out of the diet yeah. a little bit less arena a little bit <laughs> a little, I want to cut it off it's so good it reminds me of my grandmother you know yeah and that's what it is it's an emotional attachment yeah because when you eat a uh let's say like a barbacoa taco right you're feeling fancy Fancy and you're feeling guilty. rich, right? <laughs> um, and you're eating uh, just anything with like tortillas. You're not. You're like the endorphins and the dopamine and everything that you're getting. It's rewarding, like the memory of the first time you had that, yeah, just yeah. as much as like the sensation as it yeah. is right now. You know, it's bad. And uh, man, the valley is. This is supposed to be like a pro, artist valley podcast and here we are kind of just being like god damn it <laughs> we're, we're, but that's keeping it real you know because yeah. it's not perfect and it, it has a lot of um, areas of opportunity mm-hmm. um diet is you know we're not portland we'll probably never be that uh there's like a whole foods no not a whole foods um a farmer's market but in mccallan so mm-hmm. like donna and like far we have fucked to drive. yeah we have to drive yeah we have to drive um it's hard you know but i'm Reasons come first, answers come second. I've always believed that. And uh, whether if it's, I want to look better, I want to fuck better, I want to, I don't want to, like, ejaculate cottage cheese. <laughs> if it's that, if that's the leverage you need, use it, run with it, go all the way, you know. Um, but I'm working on it. I'm a work in progress. Too, I've man. lost 
I was gonna say I lost like 30 pounds, but I, I gained like 15 of them back. But I think it's a muscle because I started working out. That's I think good. it's a muscle. Yeah. I can't prove that. Yeah, don't go by weight. <laughs> I go by. No, go, yeah, yeah. But I, but I know like um, if I dropped 40 pounds of fat. I feel like I'd get more opportunity. I'd be able to get more work. I'd be able to have more energy to, to go longer uh, when it came when it comes to anything. Like half the reason this is okay. Let's just get into the show. At this point, people are like, "Why are we listening to this?" Um, I'm sitting here with uh, Luis Cantu, and uh, you know all his his work will be in the in the show notes. Check him out. Uh, shorthand, I'll say that he's a looper. Um, I, I like the way that sounds anyways, because there's maybe one in the valley and it's him and you got to check him out. Um, I met him at Yerberia Cultura. He was doing an open mic and, uh, real quick, uh, I'll get into that, but I, it's, it, I get an, almost an anxiety attack every time I go downtown. I don't know if this is normal or if most people feel this way, but it's, it's because there's such a judgy atmosphere. There's such a superficial like everybody look at me like I'm representing this kind of thing and I don't like that um uh, but I invested for the first time I'm 28 years old and I invested in um new underwear like let me show you really quick <laughs> like really quick you're gonna be like that's underwear bro like check this out right look at that all right yeah that that's looks, nice that looks comfortable and it is and it's it's been like 40 percent does that change the way that everything. you feel when you're sitting down like is that what you're gonna say like it like, changes the way uh, I feel sitting down. It changes the way I don't get like swamp ass. I don't have to worry about like, does she smell me? Like I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> and it helps me like go out and be social. Just the underwear, just that. Inv and I got new socks, you know, I'm working on new shoes. Yeah. I'm working on it. <laughs> um, I want to get Nikes because like the other day, my sister-in-law, uh, um, was like, you should go to college. And I was like, I, I tried it, it didn't really work out for me. And she was like, people will take you more seriously. And I was like, nah, I don't really think so. She's like, you know, um, and I told her, if I had bomb ass Nikes, if I dropped 40 pounds of fat, and I had a nice haircut, people would take me more seriously. More than a degree more ever than could. More a degree, yeah. Ever could. But, you know, we can't deny that. Like, beautiful people get more opportunities. That's just the reality of it, because it goes back to what we were talking earlier. It, it, behind that, people subconsciously see this guy's disciplined this if I if I ask him to come to my event he's gonna be there because he can take care of his body right so it's like yeah it's it, it's it's blended into our culture we can't deny that and it's okay it's, and it's okay it, it, it forces us to be more responsible and to be to be vigilant vigilant about our, ourselves and it's kind of, it's healthy if mm -hmm. we were like oh yeah yeah like if, if we uh, idolized fat and right. and and obesity and all that like I feel like we would, we would end up like uh, have you seen the movie uh, Wally yeah would end up like those people where, we're on our uh, way yeah <laughs> I mean do you see the str the the strollers the other day I was walking I was walking at the park you know my friends play Pokemon Go I don't I don't I don't have the the phone to run it but I, I saw people on strollers just standing and moving around and i just i can't connect to that maybe it's just me hey at least they were healthy mm -hmm. but i can't I, i'm just scared of that technology because it just makes us lazier like like it, it, it threw a flashback to that wally scene where everyone's on a chair and floating around slurpees yeah 64 rounds so slurpees. in order to combat that that reality that dystopian reality um it's good to have these these uh, values that we hold up so dear, that beautifulness in being fit, and, and fit. And yeah. I say go for it. And I yeah. like I, I've I've seen you. You know I've seen some of your videos where you you constantly keep yourself on track. Like oh, I'm yeah. gonna run today. I'm gonna run. Oh, yeah. And um, that's the way to do it. I'm like, proud to say um, since September of last year, so almost a year, I've worked out at least six days a week. Another fist bump. That's a Wait, good fist bump. Another fist bump. <laughs> um, and I'm proud of that because I've never done anything habitually and consistently like that before. And, um, you know, like Louis C.K. has a joke, you know, like he runs like Hello. five, he's Hello. the best. He runs like five miles a day to keep up his piece of shit body. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I know how that feels a little bit, but I also know, like I said, like I lost like 30 pounds and I gained like 15 of it back. It's because... Um, even though my physiology working out is there, I, I like, I'll be like, I need a 20 piece, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I kill it with my diet yeah. and it's psychological. Like you were saying, um, 
how we should reward like obese behavior. We do in Mexican culture. Yeah, that's you know, what we're like, "Ay, pues come it. You know what okay. I mean? Like, finish that plate. Yeah. Do you want more? We have more. Take some to go. Like all that stuff. We reward it because it's affection, and that's the thing that makes. And I'm sure like you know, a lot of other cultures have this, but that's the thing that makes it so d- potentially dangerous. Is we're attaching affection, love, camaraderie, family, with greasy food yeah and so it's kind of when we think we have to detach from that we're like but we're i'm losing my grandma is what people associate you feel the emotional detachment all of a sudden yeah man so i i I guess maybe the secret would be to find people that you can get emotionally attached to with healthy food yes i I mean my girlfriend genesis she's been helping me a lot with that oh yeah like she goes and takes me out and buys me a salad and gives me a good time and all of a sudden next time that i am having a salad i feel her i'm like yeah let me eat more salad that's exactly what it is um with all the help, self-help stuff that I read, um, I think they would intellectualize that as like raising your standards. And uh, I'm sure there's like some sort of Mexican way of saying this, but like if you lie with dogs, you get fleas. You are like who you surround yourself with. Like you are the the amalgamation of like the five people in your life, like yeah. that you hang out with the most. And so if those if you raise your standards and you decide, hey. I can't hang out with this person. All they want to do is smoke weed. All they want to do is like kill eat, their ambition, or, eat, yeah. and and that's rewarded. And you've linked camaraderie to that. It's going to be hard to divorce that. If you divorce that, you raise your standard. You hang out with kind of a little bit more. You know, I'm not going to say better people, but people with a, a higher standard. Yeah. You know what I mean? That are in it for the long game. Yeah, you can condition that behavior. I've for been sure. blessed with like four or five cousins that work out like daily, and I, I get inspired by them every day because I've seen the results. Yeah. I know that it works. Like I can't deny like of course, you know, and they're fit, and um, I've been hanging out with them. And you know, you're right. Like when you get emotionally attached to people that have those standards, you just feel like, hey, like I relate to this person. Mm-hmm. She did it. He did it. Mm-hmm. Maybe I can do it too. And then that all of a sudden that maybe becomes I can do it. And mm-hmm. no, I'm going to. Oh, I already have. Like, it's slowly but it is gradual even when we're young yeah yeah like i can probably lose weight faster than a 28 year old but oh, yeah, yeah. but yeah, i'm I still can, young i can just as easily like gain it back because yeah. my discipline's not there mm-hmm. as much as someone who's older and wiser mm-hmm. in, in age for sure so I, I feel like i'm 28 like I, I should be in some sort of prime of my life but i also know i don't have the 18 like elasticity anymore i don't i don't have that 18 year old like i can chug a two liter of rc and I can, I'll be fine. No, because if I do that, my day's fucked. Three days are fucked after that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so am I going to be able to go out and go to 17th Street, you know, in that state? No, I'm not. Uh, but the underwear has changed a lot of that, honestly. Yeah. I was uh, going to ask, what brand is that? If you don't mind me asking. So that the crowd, the audience knows and uh, myself. I think it's And One. And One. It might be Hanes or something, too. Yeah. Um, it it kind of, I don't know if you, saw, if you caught that, but it, it looks like, uh, like, Almost like workout shorts. Mm-hmm. Uh, they look comfortable. Uh, They're so comfortable. Yeah, they look like you won't sweat in those. Yeah. And I, 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 I've had experiences where I'm, I'm, I'm in a social environment and the sweat changes the way you think. Like mm-hmm. all of a sudden you feel uncomfortable and you start to feel right. anxious. Yeah. So I can see how little things like that can affect the way people can Changes communicate. everything. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, I was still anxious going to Yerabadi on Monday, which your name was called out, by the way. And I know, I and know. then uh, Baraba was like he he couldn't make it something came up and I was like damn it because I was uh, I had a friend there who had never seen you and I was like he's gonna fuck your world up and you weren't there and I was like cock tease cock tease something know, came up a friend time. a friend of mine really needed me so of course but uh, um, and also the night was there was like this one act that really stunned that sat out for me well, first of all there was this dude named um, I saw the metal dude uh, that metal dude was insane I've shredded. seen him before what was his name his name is Black Moon Black Moon and check him out guys he's 25 years old that's what he says and he was so talented um, and I'd seen him before but he does his set he gets his stuff and he leaves like he jets and so that's like the third time I'd seen him and instantly like it's, I got my stuff and I, I followed him before he could leave and I was like wait before you leave <laughs> I need to get your name. I need to, like, I'd love to have you on the podcast, whatever. He blew my mind. Um, and, of course, there was Filth the Terrible who yeah, yeah, yeah. put a nail through his head. The, the blockhead. The, the, yeah. The only blockhead we have in the valley yeah. that I've seen. He ate glass. I was like, dude, for an open mic, he ate glass. For real. Yeah. I was like, and he ate and swallowed glass. I have to say that. He didn't just <laughs> chew glass. He swallowed it. And th- I, like, I love and he was he like, guys, it up. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I'm going to be at Joe's Crab Shack on Friday. And I'm like... Dude, your throat's getting, you know, grated like a, you swallowed a cheese grater. 
Um, for an open mic, I was like, fuck, that is, that's like, you know, next passion. level passion. He knows, he knows what he's doing. And I, I, I love that he keeps, uh, it's serious with the acts, but then he keeps that silliness when he says like, oh, it's not going to hurt as much as when it comes out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I forgot he said that, dude. <laughs> Uh, it's so crazy, but there was this one act. Check him out, guys. I can't remember Feels his name. Terrible. And I feel terrible. Um, I think his name was like I'm gonna ruin it, but it was like Marco Alejandro Iglesias, like something like real thick Mexican. Uh-huh. And he had this entourage that followed him and recorded him. Like he had like four people. And when he after he did his set, he was like, "Thank you." And his crew like got all his stuff and like he had like an entourage. Like he was like. Even though he was one dude, he had like people that like got his stuff and took him, and he played like Santana y sort of like sad, sad guitar. Like he was making the guitar weep, like wail. And uh... I was like, dun, dun, dun. okay, that's and I was like, ow, ow, ow. And then I recorded it, and I've been wanting to put it out there online, but it wasn't like cinematic, and I don't want him to feel like I look like shit. But it's like, no, dude, it's because I didn't know. I should have went in close or something. So I, I, that's not good enough to put out there. But uh, I went up to him immediately after the show, and I was like, "I really felt the loss." Is all I told him, and he was like, "Thank you." Thank like you. he he knew like shit. I put the loss out there, and you felt it, and that was a beautiful connection. Those are the best compliments. I'll say that for as a, from a musician's really? thing, yeah, from a musician's point of view, you coming up to us and saying like, "I felt this." That's way better than, "Hey man, you were great." I la-. no. When you tell us what you felt, it's like, yeah. "All right," I, like. That's emotional connection. That's what yeah. I was looking for. Thank you for listening. Oh, cool. And that really like uh, puts us in perspective. You know, and, and I'm glad that you mentioned that because the first time I saw you, I didn't know what to expect. I saw like you brought all, all the gear, the what what is that? What do you call that? Uh, the the you, had a, box? You, you had a whole suitcase. Oh yeah, I, I carry a, a briefcase and I have my Line Six Steel Four. It's actually pretty old. It's 17 years old. It came out in 1999. Um, but what, the reason I love it was because I saw uh, Master Looper Reggie Watts, Reginald Watts. I saw him using it, and uh, I looked up interviews as to why he chose to use that box in particular. And he said he liked it because it's extremely tweakable. And so I, pur- I purchased one, and I, I, I definitely see what he's talking about now. Reggie, I, I love your choice of equipment if you if you somehow listen to this in the future. Um, but yeah, it's the ability to tweak your voice in real time. Like other loopers, uh, they, they don't have that. I don't know why they, they, it just went out of date, but these, the newer loopers have like multiple tracks. So you can have five tracks mm-hmm. and loop on top of each other. Mm-hmm. I can only have one track. Mm-hmm. So it's challenging. It's like, I have to create different atmospheres with only one track. So it's challenging for me and it kind of, but it's good because if you master the one track, once you get to five, you're going to fucking yeah, kill it. Yeah. I don't want to go into five track yet. And by the way, there is another looper here in the Valley. Her name is Sarita Cobos. You, I, oh, I don't wow. know if you saw her. She performed. I've yet to see her. Oh man. Really? Sarita Cobos. She's, she's a, she's another looper here and uh, she, she's, she uses an R 500. So she has five track loopers. Uh, she can mess with those, those ambient sounds. The first time I saw you, you were, it was a Louis gone through. And Ray Perez was like, this guy, he's like, I've never seen anything like this. Like, you're going to love it. And I was like, okay, well, then let me just start recording, right? Because you never know. And uh, my only intent behind that uh, of filming people's stuff is it deserves to be, like, immortalized. I can't, I mean, I just feel like I have this power to capture something that could live outside of us. Yeah. That like, you have to use that. And that's really what, you know, I, I, I admire that you 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 uh, increase your services. You added flashback. Yeah. Uh, before it was just the outer heaven. But mm-hmm. with flashback, like that gives even people, it gives them more opportunity for mm-hmm. events like, you know, like yeah. quinceañeras and, and all that. Yeah. And, and you're right. And, and also people, normies, like normal yeah. people. Yeah, yeah exactly. Not just, not artists. just artists. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And so, it, I mean, and now people's stuff is immortalized, you know, uh, and I think that's really cool. And it's good for people because now you know, now they see me at Yedabidi and they're like, fuck, Knives is here, like I have to do something new. Especially the comedian scene. Yeah. Like whenever they see, because, uh, you know, they're writers. Yeah. And so when, when their content is captured, they kind of feel like, oh man, like now that's out there. You can't be so precious about it. But that, I'll say though. this, mm-hmm. I'll say this to the comedians. Um, it, whenever your art is captured, like, you're, like, like Knives just said, you're immortal now. Like that joke's immortal and it's it's yours. Mm-hmm. So see it that way and see it that it's it's it forces you to create new content. Mm-hmm. So if you're into the <laughs> industry, you're, there's gonna be cameras. Mm-hmm. So yeah. knives is giving you that variable. So yeah, and I'm just one of many other people. I mean, um, my quality might be all right. 
that's the only difference. It's other than like Instagram or whatever. It's you know anybody can film something on the phone now. Um, but when I saw you, I was like, let me film this guy. And uh, you did three songs, and I, I, there was like a, you know, what I appreciated about it the most was there was nothing contrived about it. Even though there is, you're playing with artifice, <laughs> you're playing with. Um, expectations and like uh, what's the word I'm looking for like kind of like almost musical tropes you know so we're, you're playing with the familiar but in in a in a new way in a new way so I like that everybody knew like everybody had like these little anchors of like oh this sounds like this it sounds like this it sounds like this but it was new and it wasn't contrived and so I felt like whoa this is happening right now this is a new thing happening right now <laughs> this is the spider spinning a web right now like the, of, this is this is the only web of its kind is what it felt like and uh, I call it a holy moment and uh, I mean, I didn't coin that term, but it just felt like when something is being authentic and true to itself and it demands you to recognize its presence and you have to reckon with, you know, y y your, own, your, your own attention and what's happening right here. I mean, uh, that doesn't happen often, uh, especially at, at, at open mics, but also yeah. in my life. I've maybe, I haven't felt that way since 2011 when I saw... Uh, this band called La Landlock Pirates for the first time, and it was like watching Nirvana for wow. the first time. I was like, "Whoa!" Like I, this is must have what it felt like to watch Kurt Cobain in '89, and then I didn't get that feeling again until five years later or whatever with you. And I was like, "This, uh, I, I'm in the presence of a of a star right now, <laughs> and and I'm and I'm watching the origin story. And you hear this stuff, and I know like I'm sucking your dick right now, and I'm not trying to do that. I'm not trying to do that, but that just rarely happens." Hey, and I it's one thing that. to it's one thing to know that it's out there, and for me in my timeline to be present for that, uh, I, I was it, it was an honor to see that happen. I'll say, it I'll it say, doesn't happen often. Thank you, I appreciate that, and I love the analogy you used about spinning a web because when the spider is spinning the web, it actually doesn't know when it's going to stop until it reaches the middle. It just keeps going. Uh, it's hmm. some, uh, something I saw on Discovery Channel. I digress though. What I was going to say is, um, I'll, I'll say here in this podcast that. I consider myself a comedic performer, and I would fall under the category of a disinformationist, mm. which is a genre that Reginald Watts uh, started. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd love to be part of that because the, uh, the, w w I feel like the reason that that performance intrigues people mm -hmm. is because I, I, I instead of going with punchline, you know, uh, you know, premise. I'm sorry, the premise, and then, you know, getting those funny jabs and then going, ending with the punchline, I, I swirl it, mm -hmm. I mix it around, I, I uh, change conversation in the middle of a conversation, and that is rooted from Reginald Watts' mm -hmm. performances, because when I watch uh, artists like that, it confuses me, and I don't know what to expect, like you said, like, all of a sudden, I stop thinking about what's going on, and I just start listening, so I, I, I wanted to find a way, how can I, how can I, cause that yeah. you know how can i how can i entice that to happen but it causes you to pull from the elements of any of that given time is that time that uh we improvised uh i say we it's weird when i improvised bernie sanders is that was that the time or was that the second time that you were there oh good you question that? um that Wolf was the bernie. first time Wolf that, that was the i think the second thing you did and uh you did like three three tracks kind yeah. of yeah and that was a second part of that. I pulled that from the audience because someone had mentioned yeah. it. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, that's interesting. Let's try that. Yeah. Stuff, you know, that that is so raw. Is that what you meant? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I, I had to. Because you're like, somebody give me a word. And somebody was like, penis. And you're like, put, put, put. And you just started, you just made something out of the word penis. <laughs> you know, like whatever it was. And I was like, that's what I mean by it wasn't contrived. You know, it's not like you have plants in the audience and, and you're like, feed me this word <laughs> yeah. you know and it's, um, on my side it's and that's it, risky because yeah that, that there's you're setting yourself you can, up to fail you can have that asshole as like anti-establishment mentarianism you know and i'm like <laughs> okay okay buddy you know but right. no but the audience knows you know they yeah. kind of know subconsciously like if i give them an easy word it's gonna be it's gonna be nice art if i give them art but you're right um it's it's it, it is it is in the moment, and I feel like that's why I love improv music. I, I, I'm gonna say I, I, I love that you can see that and you can mm -hmm. appreciate that in artists. Mm -hmm. um, the the reason that improv art is very sacred to me is because when I do contemporary music, you know, when I'm rapping, like sometimes I feel, you know, when I'm saying a verse, 
I already know what's gonna happen. There's no, there's no surprise for me. So it's, mm. it's in a way, it's boring. Uh, I, I have to put emotion in it, or the audience doesn't feel it. But I'm in the background, like yeah, da, 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 da. like I already know what's gonna happen. Mm. With improv music, I get to amaze the audience at the same time I'm amazing myself because I'm like I'm making this up like I'm making it up on the spot I don't know what's gonna happen mm-hmm. and so it keeps me on my toes it's like what am I gonna do next what am I gonna do? that's and- my favorite place to be as an artist uh, the only way I can relate to that is in, in writing you know if I'm writing something and let's say I'm writing a conversation with two people at a coffee shop and I know persons Bill and John and I write and I, they just start talking and now I'm writing and I'm chasing their conversation but I don't know where it's going that's the only thing I can kind of relate to to that, and it's kind of not as cool as what you do. And so I can see you be like, I call it a state of unconsciousness. It's like yeah. it's like basketball players. They're playing basketball, and they don't even know what their next, what their fifth step is going to be. They just know it's going to be there. Yeah, you know what I mean. And, and and like you look at basketball, it's like how does it's like a flock of birds. Like how does it. How is your poetry it in this form- yeah, formation? How does it organize itself? Yeah, and I see that you do that. You you said you kind of put yourself on the platform where there's like I could fail, but I'll make something out of that. I'm yeah. gonna like vroom, like like an alchemist, like bring that back <laughs> and be like, bah, I bring up. You see, I was all part of the plan, you know. Um, and I like that you did that. And there was a sense of um, command, you know, uh, when I saw you go out there. And you're 24 years old. 23. 23. Fuck. Um, you know, you, you have so much more to offer and you're going to explore and you're going to turn into like nine different things by the time like you're 30, you know, but, um, you know, when I saw you for the first time, I was like, where has this guy been and how long, like, I wanted to know everything and here we are now, but I wanted to know like, how did he get here? How hard was it? Where is he going? Is he a Valley native? What if he's not? (laughs) Like, what if he's some prick that came from LA to just come over here? (laughs) <laughs> and, and like take all of our energy and then go back and feel good about himself. I'll, 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 I'll revert this. I'll, I'll say that um, I, I was pretty tired of hearing the Valley sucks. The Valley does not have talent. And so, uh, you know, me, I, I love the Internet and I've always been online. And I, I even watched videos on Yerbria before I performed there, you know, because I couldn't go. I didn't have right. I didn't have a car or whatever. But, uh, you know. When, when I found out that that venue opened, I'm like, you know, I've been a closet musician for so many years. And that it opened up a year ago, a couple of days ago. Yeah, that, that's yeah. our anniversary. When I found out about it, I, I said, I have to go try this. Because, um, you know, it was a road where different people inspired me. My, my, my grandfather inspired me to play guitar, and I started with that. Uh, Razel, a beatboxer, inspired me to beatbox. Uh, Reggie Watts inspired me to improvise. And uh, tell me about the first moment you saw Reginald Watts and you were like, fuck, let, let me tell you my first time. Cause it was, I, I'll throw a year out there. It was I, back then when I would watch television I think he's a, and I saw him do a music video that was a uh, fuck shit, fuck shit, fuck shit, fuck shit. Fuck shit. Yeah. And I was like, this guy is hilarious, but also there is a musical mastery to what he's yes. doing that I appreciate it. And so you know that he's not full of shit, even he's though he's, not. even though he's talking about scatological humor as they say he, he's oh, man. so that was my first time i saw that music video and he's like what did he say he's like uh, uh i'm an imperialist i'm an imperialist Well, that whole thing yeah i'm a materialist yeah i'm an imperialist <laughs> yeah that whole thing and i was like this right guy's the motherfucker <laughs> <laughs> and the, the butt made... shit stack that I, whole I, thing the first yeah. time i showed that video to someone they thought he was being serious uh, and i had to explain to them he's okay. he's, par- he's now, it's a parody okay i'm i, I I want to get into the mo- your like oh my god come to Jesus moment with with Reggie Watts. But let me just say uh, uh, you know you're talking that you love like the humor side of this, the musical humor. It's alt comedy, right? It's yeah, alternative it's, comedy. Yeah. And the best part about it is it's an inside joke, right? A and there's giant people, there's people that are outside the bubble, like, and Ew. and it is kind of at their expense. That's what makes it work. That's what makes all comedy work uh-huh. is a juxtaposition. It right? has to be. Is yeah. a contrast. So those people like the smaller the bubble, the kind of funnier potentially the all comedy can be. Yes. And most people aren't going to get that. And that's what makes it fun. You don't want to explain. You don't want to tell people about the strings. You are the puppet. And if people get it, great. They get it. They're a part of the inside joke. They're a part of the, they're inside the bubble. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that person that you showed Reggie Watts to, they didn't get it. They didn't get it. And they were outside the bubble. But yeah. that's kind of. That's why it's funny. That's and, he, why... And, and he's also putting his work out there to those people that don't get it. Yeah. And yeah. subverting that. And he's like, yeah, I'm one of those rappers that are like smacking women <laughs> in the fat asses. And. 
and people think like, oh, he's objectifying women, and it's like <laughs> he's a making parody. fun of the people that it's do a parody. That. I'll say this: the first video I watched where Reggie Watts performed was actually a TED talk. It was this TED talk where uh, he I know made, that one very well. Yes, he makes fun of the way that uh, the people at TED Talks talk, and uh, uh, you know he he makes he makes that accent with Alan Watts, and he just starts going on random consciousness. But what it immediately intrigued me is that he began talking in a different language, mm-hmm. like uh, and then he goes into France, and then he goes into German, and he finally goes into English. That to me is a perfect. It's like he's like the epitome of Reddit. When you read hmm. comments on a web page, it does look like that. Like people have different dialects and different. So when it immediately intrigued me, I was I was like, okay, this guy, this guy is definitely an internet nerd. And I started listening, and what what intrigued me was similar to how you felt in my performance. I didn't know what to expect. Most videos, when you click on a video, you know how it's gonna end by the first ten seconds. You know where it's going, what the topic is. With Reginald Watts, you can't. You just no matter how much you try, you don't know where it's gonna end up. And but I, you but you know there's a trust where you're in good hands. Yes, because because he's he's he has his years in, in music. He's classically trained. He he studied in, uh, he studied jazz for two years. Um, you know he beatboxed for several years, and um, he's a multicultural person. Yeah, he uh, his his I believe his parent he had two different. Uh, uh, his dad was from Germany and his mom was from France or backwards. I don't know if I, have, if I have it mixed up, but he's definitely, he says that one of his advantages was that he had an objective view of culture because he moved around a lot. Mm-hmm. So he got to see and listen to different languages and that's what you see in his art. And I feel like he's a master of absurdity. Mm-hmm. He is so absurd that... Uh, and his absurdity jokes, is fun. Yeah. It's fun. His jokes are, are body language. His, his jokes are mannerisms, uh, tone of voice. He makes fun of all that. And it feels like... Uh, oh, yeah, I'm just thinking about this right now. And I kind of relate to this in a way. Um, I kind of feel like he... Okay, did you ever see Men in Black? Yeah. You know that alien that exists inside that dude's face? And he's like... The galaxy belongs in the right <laughs> yeah. I kind of feel like Reggie Watts is like this alien inside the body that he inhabits. I was going to say like that. Like, he, he doesn't belong in that body. Like, he's kind of something bigger than his body. Yeah. Because he plays with it like it's a Trojan horse. For real. He honest. I, I was going to say, when you asked me the question, what did you think? The first time I saw Reggie Watts, I thought he was out of this world. I'm like, this is not a human being. This is, uh, for this real. Is the, it's like we're talking about David Bowie here. That's just how out there he was. Uh, he seemed like a deity to me. Because there's moments where you're watching his videos and he kind of knows what you're thinking. Did you see Reggie for the first time sober? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay. But I'll say this: there when, might be some residual when, sort yeah, of thing going yeah, on there. Yeah. When, when I watch when I watch uh, him sober, I feel high. But when I'm high mm. and I watch him, I feel higher. So that's that's a thing. Like it really does feel like that. It's a psychedelic experience. Um, I'm highly influenced by him. I was gonna say this: there's a moment. Uh, where I was watching the video and uh, he kind of influenced my thoughts in a way. Mm. And I asked myself a question and he answered it. And that to me shows that he knows how to prime our brains. He knows how to prime okay. expectations. Okay. What do you mean by prime our brains? Like there's, I forgot what video it was, but I, I know the verse. Um, it really hit me. It hit home. He says, at that point I was very depressed, but momentarily, you know, we, we go into those dips. And I was watching that video and I was thinking about time and he's doing, you know how he like, he almost like morphs like a chameleon into different things, mm-hmm. to different people. It almost feels like he, like you said, he plays with his body like it's a Trojan horse. Well, as he was, it was, it was he was transforming in, in between these, these chameleon like states of mind, he looks straight at the camera and he, and he says, I know it feels like we're here right now, but we're really, really not. We're somewhere in the future controlling the options, giving lots of hints to ourselves. That That took me on a trip. I was like, this guy knows something. I want to follow him. I want to meet him. And that's where that moment I said, this guy's my dad. Yeah. Like he, I, he's someone that I could follow. You're you're one of the first people that I've met that I talked about it in the first episode of this podcast, uh, where kind of it's like an orientation of like what my brain's really about. And you know, I was saying like you know, a Marilyn Manson was my dad. Like he raised me and gave me more than like a father. A man in a boy's life is so important, yeah. one shape or another. Yeah. And you just saying that really outside of my own influence, like I didn't pervert. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. The first time we talked. Yeah, I didn't like inject that. Uh, term or meme into you 
you were just like that guy's like my dad, and I was like, I know you know all too about, well right? where you're coming from. Well, he's raising me. I don't. I, I mean, I lost my father when I was seven years old. I'm sorry to hear that. It's all right. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't know that, man. Grown out of that. Wow. But um, ever since then, like I've looked online for for a father like sure figure, and yeah. I I found one uh, when I was watching wrestling. Actually, Shawn Michaels. I loved the way that he talked about spirituality and God mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. And he was a fellow that I followed for a while. Oh, cool. And that's what got me into it. That's why I relate to you a lot, because I know you have that with CM Punk. Yeah. I mean, drug-free. I got a, I know he has a Pepsi logo. Oh, this thing's like burn out because of my skin. But uh, yeah. uh, I showed Luis my Sprite tattoo of like <laughs> of like the, the soda product, Sprite, uh, because it was a sign of solidarity from CM Punk. You know, he had a Pepsi tattoo that said, I don't drink. I don't drink, yeah. It's funny. I was, I was at Mac Knight the other day, and uh, this comedian, really talented dude, um, wanted to buy me a drink. People always want to buy me drinks, and I'm like, I don't drink. I, I feel like <laughs> such a bummer, you know. And they're like, it's like I just blue balled somebody. But I, I don't drink. But anyways, uh, that that feeling that you that you got with Shawn Michaels, I can totally relate to that because it's someone that's like, here's this guy that has gone through shit, yeah, that has gone through demons, um, but has some sort of faith or something. Um, there's a passion there, and there's triumph at the end, and that is definitely something to, you know, um, that's something to admire at the very yeah. least. And you know that's before I got into music. I was really big into my family, my uh, my aunt's side of the family. We were really big into into SummerSlam and mm -hmm. to World, you know, WrestleMania and all mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. um, and we would watch it together. And Shawn Michaels was that was that per every time I heard his switch in music, mm -hmm. you know, I just mm -hmm. I get super happy. Oh, he's gonna win the match. He's gonna win. But I was gonna say like I knew it was. Fake. I mean, sure. movies are fake. Right. We books, we, we know the fake. We know the you know? Muppets aren't real. Yeah. But like, it's also fun to be like that. It's it yeah. Exists. And it's when when you uh, when you're watching wrestling. I was you know we were talking earlier in the car. It's like it's like you're watching a uh, an act 360 degrees. Yes. And you have professional That's actors. Exactly what it's like. You have a director. You have people on microphone. You know, it's legit and uh, it's one of its kind. You know, I don't think I don't think it's ever gonna die. It, there's just too much. There's so much um, growth in it, mm -hmm. and um, it's yeah, one, it's one of the first art forms, really. It's yeah. theater. Yeah, it was one of the first art forms ever. Yeah. So it's, you know, Sean, Sean. I was gonna say, you know, tie it to tie it back. Shawn Michaels was one of my first dads that I found and I clinged on to. And once I learned what he could teach me, then I moved on, and you know, I'm like, where's? Where? But it'll always be a dad. Yeah, I feel like mm -hmm. like it's the same. Like in life and consciousness, you get these these deities or these energies that guide you, mm -hmm. and they they're not. They're not uh, confined to a vessel. Right. They move around, and so you have to be aware and follow them. And I feel like right now, my my guidance is in Reggie Watts. Right. But it's all, I think we had this conversation. We kind of had this conversation the first time we met when I went up to you at the bar, and I was like, here's my card. Wait, but before I even blah, 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 <laughs> I love your work. And I think we talked about this. Um, otherwise, it's like deja vu or something, but... Yeah. Um, Gosh, what was that thing that you just said right now? Oh yeah, the vessels. The vessels. I kind of feel I have this theory, um, and it's so cool that this kind of came up organically. So, and maybe this is like a male thing, like being the best of all time, yeah. or this is the greatest thing of all time. Like yeah. I don't think that's a feminine trait. Like I don't think that's a feminine perspective. I think it's a male thing of like champion. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like ultimate alpha male. We're hunters. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so with that aside, I'm gonna alienate the women for a second, but. Um, I had this feeling of, you know, people ask me, what's the greatest movie of all time? And I'm like, you know, there is no one greatest movie of all time, but I can name and cite a hundred films where in a moment it's being, it's scene, yeah. It, yeah, yeah, it's being the greatest movie of all time. And so that's what makes it the greatest movie of all time, but it's in a moment and I can literally pause a movie and be like, right there, everything that's going on and all the stuff in front of the camera and behind it. It's being the best movie of all time. And I, and I take that a step further and I say, it's, if you look at uh, whatever makes something the best, if you look at it as a, as a fabric and some sort of object. Yeah. Do we have this conversation? Yeah, please. If, so keep. If, it's a, if it's a scroll, mm -hmm. if it's like a fabric, you know, and, and um, there's a tapestry about it, I feel like when something's being the best thing of all time, it is a part of the fabric. And it's all part of the same fabric. Yeah, yeah. So if... If, um, so take that kind of oneness with, okay, this guy's my dad, and now this guy's my dad, but it's part of the same fabric, so, you know, we kind of said this uh, as well with Reggie, bear with me here, um, 
you know, his vessel, like his soul, that is kind of like just that kind of light um, goes from vessel to vessel to vessel. It's all part of one. It's one light. It comes from one source. Yes. And it's a beautiful thing. And it doesn't belong anywhere to anybody. And sometimes it's just taking the shape of whatever thing is bouncing off of it in that moment. We lost everybody here on this. People are like, "Uh, I tuned out here at this point. (laughs) But I mean, what I'm trying to say is everything's kind of one. Everything really is. It it comes from the same source, whatever that is. But the distinction and the power comes from recognizing a distinction and saying, this is special right now because of this layer, because of this uh, coat of primer, this paint, the oils, the the textures is what makes it interesting. But underneath it is something I'm very familiar with, you know? And that is, that brings us together, man. Yeah, when a moment breaks that fourth wall and connects you no matter what, where you're at, yeah, it does feel like it's no longer humans interacting. I'll say this, I have an analogy that I I live by and uh, Nikola Tesla, uh, he I think he added he added he he knew things. Um, he said that the brain is like a receptor, like an like an antenna. Oh, wow! And and there is a one source that you can tune into, and everyone can tune into, and it's up to you to tune that frequency. Yes. He said a lot of people. Nikola Tesla would say a lot of us choose to have low frequency, and that's okay. We need that too in order to to coexist. But he said those of you that tune into the higher frequencies can pick up certain. F- certain radiation from that source and create wow. things for those that are lower wow. and um, that actually explains a lot but i'll say this i'll say this the, the way that i like to see it is you know how our brain is composed of neurons mm-hmm. now let's in a hypothetical situation let's say those neurons have personalities and they have goals and emotions well just how because in these neurons and genes and in, in the microcosms of the world it contains information yes Go and on. we can we can't say that they that they don't live a subjective reality we don't have proof of that but if we can if we can write on that uh, on that idea that these neurons uh, have their own lives and all that uh, you can relate the brain to how our planet is working each person is like a neuron and when we connect you know we call it networking because it is but when we connect we uh we form stronger uh ideas as a society so i see what you mean about the fabric that fabric is when when neurons connect in a way where where we get a a a aha moment a eureka moment uh, a, a realization when when we feel that together as people like those actors behind that scene that director behind that's influencing the the, the cinematographers mm-hmm. that are capturing the microphone technician the sound engineers mm-hmm. when all those people are working together with those those neurons mm-hmm. then we form a, a new idea and with mm-hmm. that new idea like it causes more synapses in our society and yeah it, it, i kind of i'd like to see the planet functioning like a massive brain like a massive uh, per, uh, uh, it could be a per, uh, uh, an organic a hundred percent you know and it's challenging because you know creature. um since each person on the planet if if the if the earth is the gray matter of like a brain uh-huh. if the earth is and people are these neuro networks uh-huh. um the thing that is like uh that t- takes it into another dimension is like each person is, has an ego yeah that doesn't even that that can't think for a bigger picture mm-hmm. that is only self-serving mm-hmm. and so it's hard for it to be kind of get to a place of yeah. uh, transcendence we kind of have a mental illness as a planet yeah. and and yeah you're you're right on there is we oh, have to you're, you're we, hurting me in the heart we have to evolve past that if we want wars to go away if we want hunger and famine all that stuff to go away we can't live in mental illness we have to get on the same page and realize hey maybe maybe my ego is meant to to help me in other ways like and it's at this point like where the, if you said this on um, fox news you'd be assassinated and i'd be muted actually I'd yeah. be, as soon as i started talking about it i would be muted oh we'll be right back with that uh, i seem to have some technical issues and why because the the people that are in place already the people that are already there they know that if if uh, our planet massively if if the if the consciousness of our planet evolves, then their profiteering systems might not survive. That's right. They don't like that. That's right. They want a world where they can. Here here's the thing, knives that really bothers me. I'm glad that this came out organically as well. The thing that bothers me the most of of this society is that um, we've we've. Been... And this is important because you're an artist, and in a way, this this is kind of fuels our work. This is an engine for yeah, what we do. This is where look this at where... look at the Malcolm X's, the Bruce Lee's, the John Lennon's. I mean, this fueled their work as well. Yeah, I, it's I, a humanitarian I... sort of quality to what we do. I mean, not to suck our own dicks. This isn't about 
like, wow, let's reward ourselves. We're so smug right now. <laughs> I'm going to fart into a can and smell it. It smells so good. But I mean, this is important. This is the yeah. real shit. This is, this is where, what matters. This is and also like, in a world where I have personally accepted, and I'm sorry for interrupting, please hold on to that thought. It. But in a world where I've accepted that Trump is going to be president, I've accepted it. Yeah, me too. Because he is Godzilla and we have shot nukes at this guy and nothing affects him. You know, satire has not brought him down. Like it, nothing is. So I can see this guy coming president and doing like, you know, two years and being like, man, I don't want to do this anymore. And then kind of split. He's going to see that it's real, and it's like, I don't want this. And, and I feel like, he's not going to be able to do it, and it's whatever. But I've accepted, like, we live in that timeline, you know, in community. It's a show. representation of our... We, we live in the darkest timeline, yeah. unfortunately. If you look in history, dude, somebody's president was Saddam Hussein. Like, some, you know what I mean? This isn't, like, that's... <laughs> we live in that world. Believe. Yeah, yeah like, we live in a world happens. where sometimes, dude, I, I went Hitler, through... You know? I went through, in my life, I went through Bush, Bush, Clinton, Clinton... Bush, Bush, Obama. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, I went through so much, like, regurgitation and crap. Like, it was whatever order that was. But, I mean, like, I, I totally see the timeline where we, we do get Trump. Anyways, I, what I'm trying to say is what you're about to say is important and it's relevant to this podcast. Yeah. Um, what really bothers me about the society, unfortunately, is that we've disillusioned ourselves uh, to the beauty of, of what it is to be aware. And... Uh, and somehow these men these salesmen have copied the way that influencers speak and they've they've robbed that from us and they sold they sell it back to us as luxury the the ability to be aware of ourselves because the reason that we can't be aware all the time is because of economic uh you know struggle and and all that what they've done is they've taken that sense of enlightenment they've taken that sense of of the exuberance of of being um of 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 unity of the exuberance of wow this is important and they yeah. and they've they've put it on they've associated it across the world to Coca Cola yeah so now it's, it's like brands now that has what it's come <laughs> down to and I say Coca Cola because it's the number one company on the planet the planet yeah that spends hundreds of billions of dollars on advertising and the way they advertise is based on decadence. It's like, look at Taylor Swift. She represents white America. She represents innocent America. She represents decadence and teen and youth. And then once her fucking ticket expires, there's going to be another, another one yeah. and another one, another one. And Coca-Cola gets to take, you know, a, you know, like Michael Jackson, a guy that like fucking mattered, like a guy that was a black face on television at a time where music, you know, didn't have a face and it was a black face. And Pepsi got all over that and was like, now he represents Pepsi. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that fucking hurts. Yeah. You know, um, so there is a perversion in, in something that is supposed to be sweet and it's supposed to be preserved and it's supposed to be protected. And uh, they, they take it and they run with it and they, they kind of smear shit on the walls with it. And they call it and they say, but an artist was behind that, you know, and they hurt us in the process. And it, and it hurts a whole new generation that's coming up, you know what I mean? And it's like, fuck, and it's perverted them, and that's all they've ever known, you know what I mean? And uh, damn, it's really damaging. And I think we've seen it in the past 50 years especially. It fucked the world up, you know what I mean? Real quick, um, you know, in the 60s when it was peace, love, man, you know what I mean? Um, people were doing drugs, people were having sex, uh, feminist revolution was happening, um, people were fighting for the rights, Vietnam, Nixon, Kennedy, all that stuff. And, you know, the media was like, shit's crazy. Like, we have to do something. And then Charles Manson, you know, um, a singer, an artist, Charles Manson, Charles Manson an artist, um, gets these people to kill Hollywood, right? And then they use Charles Manson, who never technically did anything wrong, technically. I mean, you can say conspiracy or whatever, but... Um, I'm not saying Charles Manson is innocent, but you know what I mean. I just, and and this, and they use this guy as a poster child to kill the momentum of the '60s. I'm not saying anything new here, but and they've done it ever since. And they take something that was pure and good and could have been different and new and could have been a tangent that could have yielded a positive result that could have, and they killed it and they neutered it and they said, "Hey, LSD creates the Manson family," and they killed something, um, and it was dead after that. You know, and that's sad. We lost something, and it's happening again today. And people tweet about it instead. I feel like it was a crime to 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 blame that situation on Charles Manson, because he sold an idea. He sold a 
he would he would talk about evolution of consciousness. Those people chose to do what they did because they're influenced by the violence that they see. And at that time, the government and the media was you know propagandizing the the whole war and all that. And I feel like that's that wasn't Charles Manson's fault. But I see what you're talking about. He was a he was a connoisseur of consciousness, and he was trying to evolve people to think a certain way. Like if you see any of the interviews, which I'm sure you have, yeah. the way he speaks is 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 I, I feel it's on a higher frequency. He mm -hmm. plays with the words that he's saying, and he's poetic in the way he speaks. And I feel uh, honestly, I feel people at the top were afraid of him because he could influence people in such a way that uh, if he wanted to, he could say like, "Let's overthrow the government," and millions of people would, would follow him. True. But he didn't choose to say that. Yeah. Instead, he chose to be a gentleman and and man like. I send positive vibes to him. I, I, I've sent him a letter, uh, mm -hmm. believe it or not. And, no, I believe it. Yeah, and, and he reads all that stuff, and no, he hasn't replied. But I'm, I know that somewhere in there he, he read what I told him, and I, I hope he understands that he uh, he's in a situation that he shouldn't be in. Uh, I'm here to say... Um, There's people who oh, that control the conversation in our country who have committed way more, way more heinous in acts. And have gotten away with it because they can they can pay to get away with it. Yeah, Charles Manson didn't have the money to get with get away with it, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, man, like if, if we go back to the idea that our that our planet functions like an organism, then uh, then the faster we, we when we can see that we'll start to see that that uh, we're in danger, you know, with the pollution and all that, the the neurons, um, the, the 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 environment, the biosphere within within that within that. Uh, idea is in danger because of our actions and we vote by the things we purchase we vote by the way we behave around others so we can we can like i, I want to say like we're knives and i are not talking shit about uh, about uh, corporate america yeah, it's us it, it's society and i'm part mm -hmm. of, i'm a participant mm -hmm. of society mm -hmm. and when i when we say they we actually mean us you know because um, we influence everyone else around us so all we have to really do is let's 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 stop saying my god is bigger than your god and and my religion is better than yours let's find a, a common ground where we can say this is real let's base our reality off of something that we can all agree on let's build isis a church yeah. and say that is your church <laughs> and it's beautiful and we got we got our best people to do that for you you're welcome and we're not asking for anything in return right if we you know we gave isis a church to do their stuff you know and you let us do our stuff in our institution what would happen i don't know what would happen right what would happen why do we have to uh, act so violently why do we have to drop on bombs on on families and kill kids because we think isis is there i, f I feel like you know how there's different types of archetypes with humans uh, you can relate that with the different cells that we have in a body so you have some blood cells you have some 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 white blood cells those the, the white blood cells they're they're there to destroy things that threaten the body mm -hmm. so when a new idea comes out in, the, in in our collectiveness some of these people feel like they need to attack it and i feel like mm -hmm. people like isis they're like white blood cells and they mm -hmm. don't mean to behave the way that they do it's just we were conditioned to behave like that mm -hmm. but if we we go out there and say hey man you're you're like a cell and you're part of something bigger and you right. show them a bigger picture Perhaps they can become aware of what they are, and sure. then attack the correct things, attack oppression, attack negativity. And, and even, I mean, I, even with negativity, it can be acceptable sometimes. Like all the criticism that I've received that has made me better, it was negative. Never have I gotten better. Like what? Someone's... And and I, and same for me. Yeah. I have people that have torn down something that I put a hundred hours yeah. in, and and, and and they're like this. Here's why this doesn't work, and it was inherently flawed, which is because I'm inherently flawed, because yeah. it represented me, and I put a piece of my soul, like a horcrux, into that thing, and then I took it personal, because I was like, ouch, you're saying I'm shit, and I was like, wait a second, but I can fix that and make it better, yeah. thank you. This guy's trying to help you. This guy's yeah, trying I'm to sorry. help me. You can tell when someone's trying to help you or hurt you, you know? And when someone's trying to help you, they they're very careful about it. They're like, uh, "Here's what I here." They kind of like, you know, when someone really doesn't want to help you, they they lie to you. They tell you, they tell you, "Oh no, dude, it's great. You're doing good. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's mm -hmm. perfect." What even has, though they, what has somebody said to you about your art, um, and who were they, and how did it affect you? 
uh, this is very personal, but it was my stepdad. Uh, you, we still have time here. No, we're good. Um, we're we gonna stay here until they kick us out. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> um, my stepfather, uh, the 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 most recent one I have, he came up to me one day when I was practicing guitar. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Oh, we got the we got the go home All call. Right. But uh, I mean, go ahead, please, All your right. stepfather. Um, I was practicing guitar and I was I was practicing a rap, and yeah, he was I guess he was just having a bad day. He comes up to me and he tells me. He tells me you're never gonna make it in the music industry, and I'm like, why do you why do you tell me that? And he's like, because you keep practicing, you keep practicing here, but you never go out there. He's like, out there is where people will criticize you, where you will get better. You can't get better if you're just in the in the closet, you know, performing for yourself. And I kind of took that really, and it hurt my ego. I was like, this guy just told me I'm not gonna make it. But he he woke me to a certain part of me, and that's why I started going out open mics because I said, okay, well, that's one person's idea. Let me hear the world. And that, that girl's like it's giving me bad looks. Yeah. But um, let me just say, I think when people say something like that, it, it comes from the positive intent. Yeah, that's and, what and, I thought. And we really have to ask people, like, you know, what is their intent behind this? And it, there almost always is a positive intent. We, if we choose to focus on if it you that choose way, to focus, if you step out of your ego, Luis, I think that's the the, the most appropriate way to end this. Um, you know, I want to leave the door open uh, in the future to do more shows. That's uh, great, man. W- w- where can people find you on the internet? Where can they find me? Um, I'm usually on my Facebook, so uh, you can you can look me up, Luis Cantu. Uh, it's, I mean, you can easily tell my profile. Um, do you have Instagram? I have no. I, I had Instagram. It was actually uh, deleted somehow. I feel like uh, I broke a rule or something by okay. the, the topics I was talking about. Sure. How to do with sure. consciousness and the mm-hmm. governments. But um, I, I have a Twitter. Okay. Um, where, where can people find you? L three C T U R E. So just type in. You know, it's it's my my initials, Luis Enrique Cantu, but with the E backwards, the three. L three C T U R E lecture. I just cool. love to. Le- I, I I used to be a a teacher actually for a boys and girls club for uh, substituting so yeah um you can find me on uh twitter you can find me on facebook and i also have a youtube channel called lecture on the mic beautiful which i'll, I'll i'm gonna get active uh, awesome and of course guys you can see them at yerberia cultura which is on 17th street in mccallan monday, on monday night monday nights 9 p.m uh, be there guys it's a wonderful atmosphere there it's very uh conscious uh, quite a p- bit of people show up sometimes 30 40 people and I would say uh, every Monday night there's always gems of just like where has this person been my whole yeah life? and there's new people every once in a while and thanks to tonight's work it's getting out there uh, people are, are the way that you capture these moments and immortalize them it's, uh, it's helping the community and I'm here I don't know if people thank you but I honestly uh, I, I thank you from the deepest five breaks in my heart uh, I, I'm willing to volunteer help you with your cause because you're going to help out our community to have a voice again. The RGB voice. RG voice. <laughs> Thank it's you, been sir. a great time, guys. It's great having Thank you. Thank you for having I'll me. I'll see you down the road. Thank you again, sir.